If you're starting to get into board games, we think these are 10 great games to start your collection with and buy first. What's everybody? I'm Mike. I'm Nick. We are the Brothers Murph, and if you are a new board gamer uh, in just trying to find out more about games, first of all, welcome to the oh, hobby. Well, We're super glad to have you. Uh, we are going to talk about 10 games that we think are really uh, good for those first purchases that begin just a, a little budding collection. Yeah. These will give you kind of a nice rounded out, um, you know, different kinds of games experiences, a couple games that kind of grow into a yes. little bit, um, and things to, to start off as a launching pad into this hobby. Indeed, and we kind of want this to be kind of like a living document. So if you are more experienced in the hobby, you're past that 10 games, down in the comments below, please put other games you think are great to start with, because yep. there are a whole bunch more and if you're newer to the hobby make sure to look down in the comments there's probably gonna be a whole bunch of a ton so we really want this to be a community-led yeah. uh, effort here to uh show people as many great games to start with as possible indeed because there really are so so many so much so that we're actually gonna have another 10 games that we think are really great to start with over on our patreon if you're interested in that make sure to support our patreon today please do link down in the description and above here to go to that so will be 10 more games over there but let's go to get into our main 10 right here uh, let's get number 10 so number 10 is going to be a game called Cartographers. Yes. This is a game where uh, you are making a map. You or are you're you're, yeah. you're walking around and figuring out where things are in yes. this kind of magical land where a lot of different games kind of take place in Ulos it's called. Yes. Uh, and this is a flip and fill game where yes. everyone is going to have a card revealed and everyone's going to have to add that card which will show some types of landscapes and a shape. You kind of have to draw that landscape in kind of like Tetris shapes. Tetris shapes into your map. Now where you place it and stuff is up to you, but we all have the same kind of cards in the same order that we have to add into our map if yes. possible yes and it's super super fun because you would think like the hive mind that everyone would do the exact same thing but you don't it's like everyone yeah. has to put in kind of like the classic tetris l that's a forest and everyone just puts it somewhere different and right. so even though you're all going off of the same thing you all are going off the same cars your maps look wildly different because you're just in a different part of the world at least that's the theme absolutely and each of the types of landscapes like forests and water and farms and things are going to have different scoring conditions from game to game these will change yes so you might want to have a bunch of your your uh farmlands and waters right next to each other and for every kind of shared side those two have you'll gain a point so depending on those scoring conditions you're going to want to build out your map in a different way yeah. from game to game which makes this game infinitely replayable yes. because the cards in the order that those come out will always be different the scoring conditions and the order those come out will always be different. Yes. So that will vastly change the strategy you need to use. And it really, really does. And another nice thing about a lot of roll and rights or flip and fills, this kind of genre of games, is a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, you can kind of play with as many people as you want. And cartographers yeah. like that because you flip over a card, everyone is drawing that card. So as long as you have enough of these sheets, which you can print out online, you can literally play with hundreds and hundreds of people because yeah. everyone's going off of the same information. So that's also really, really nice. And one of the reasons why it's a good thing one to start with is because it's easy to get in into it's really addictive and fun and you can kind of play with really two people one person 100 people it really doesn't matter cartographers is great and it's a really great place to start flip and fills roller are awesome and this is honestly probably our favorite one so number 10 let's get to number nine potato man Potato Man and his trusty sidekick, Cheese Boy. Cheese Boy! This is a game called Potato Man, <laughs> which is a trick-taking game, although this one works a little bit differently. Yeah. So if you're familiar with the concept of trick-taking, that'd be a game like Hearts and Spades. A lot of classic card games yes. uh, follow this, where someone will lead with a certain suit of card. Everyone must follow if possible. In Potato Man, it's actually the opposite, where there's different colors of cards, and if I led with red, for example, no one else can play red. Yes. So everyone has to play a different color that has not been played in this hand uh, and if you can't, then the I round ends. Green, the next person can't play red or green. There's red, green, yellow, and blue. Yeah, so you're trying to always play a different color than has been played before, and you want to play the highest number possible. The different colors of cards, the suits, essentially, uh, will have a different range of numbers and things. Yeah. Uh, and you're trying to do that to be able to take these sacks, which are worth points, and you play a certain number of rounds and things like that. So what's really fun is the concept's fairly straightforward. Yes. Don't play a color that's been played before. Uh, but in trick-taking games, there's always this kind of second language that evolves of... I can't say what cards I have in my hand, but by playing something, I might reveal a little bit about the nature of my hand, yes. where it's like, man, this person seems to have a lot of blue, so let me try to exploit that by playing a blue card, so now yes. they can't play one of their blues. Exactly. Uh, and things like that. And there's also Potato Man, who's our superhero, and Lord Fry, the, the ultimate arch villain. Yes. So if Lord Fry ever gets played, you can beat them with a Potato Man card, which is a very low card. Yes. Otherwise, they the have Potato one, twos, Man and threes. One through three in yellow, and the Lord Fry is 16, 17, and 18, the highest cards in the entire game yeah. in red. 
But, you but Potato Man always beats Lord Fry. Yeah. If you play Potato Man when Lord Fry, Fry is in the trick. And so it's another little wrinkle in there. Yeah. But the reason why we like this one over a lot of other trick-taking games is because it's just really stripped down. It's yeah, super, simple. super simple. The kind of like second hidden language there is minimized. It's still there, so it's still a good thing to learn. But if you're playing against like really experienced like hearts players or spades players... They just, you play a card and they just know your entire life story. Because you're like, oh, you played a three of diamonds, now I know that you don't have the six of clubs. And I'm like, how did you know that? Because they just know everything. There you go. And Potato Man, that's kind of stripped down. It's very simple. You just can't repeat the color. And uh, Potato Man always beats Lord Fry. That's really, and then the highest card wins. That's basically the entire rules. It's a great way to get into these kind of trick-taking card games. And then from there, you can move into some of the more complicated ones because there's so many amazing ones. But a lot of them are kind of tough starting points. And yeah. I think Potato Man is a really good starting point. Yeah, I think it's a great place to kind of get into learning, like, how do I manage this hand of cards in the order that I play them in so yes. that I always can maintain control, yes. which is always kind of the goal in those yes. trick-taking games. Yeah, it's real small and nice. Just a deck of cards. It's really, really good. Package. Art's really weird so, yeah. and silly. Our number nine is going to be Potato Man. Potato Man. So number eight is a game called The Castles of Burgundy. Now this is, if you're new and stuff, this is a little more complicated, okay? Indeed. So this is a this is one of our games that we would say you're going to grow into playing this game. But this yes. is a classic, what they call Euro game. Yeah. Euro style game from a European designer uh, that's usually about stuff in the past. Uh, and this is, is about castles in Burgundy. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but this is a game that's all about mitigating dice rolls. So if you... Uh, grew up playing games, a lot of them are roll the dice and move the distance it tells you to, and you have no choices to make with those dice. Yes. This game is all about making choices with the dice that you roll, and you even have the ability to change the dice that you yes. rolled into other numbers. Which is always nice. uh, And th those numbers are going to do everything. So with each die that you use on a turn, you can do one of four things. You can grab a tile from the central board from the same. So if it's a number two, for example, there'll be a depot number two that has tiles. You can take it from that yep. depot. On your board, you have a bunch of spaces you can place things that are color-coded and also number-specific. So if I have a, a, a beige building tile, I could place it on a two space. Yep. Uh, you can ditch that die for workers, or there's also goods you can sell that, again, will pertain to certain numbers. You so you have to match. Two goods. Yeah. yeah, so everything kind of comes down to matching those numbers. Yes. Uh, everything is really kind of the reason we suggest this game is that everything's kind of simple and laid out. Like, if you yes. have a three, you can see exactly where threes are on your board, what threes provide for me on the main board, and things like that. So there's not a lot of guesswork or things no. to remember. There's actually relatively few rules to remember for the game being as deep as it exactly. is. Exactly. We did a, re a list recently where we talked about games with low rules but really high strategy, and this is one of the classic examples of those kinds of games, where even if you are very new, you can probably learn the rules to this pretty easily, and then there's just, literally, people have played this game for decades just learning the strategy, um, yeah. because it's just so, so deep and so good. Um, but the rule overhead is actually not that bad again not it's not what we would consider like a gateway game like for very 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 new people yeah you're gonna want to work your way up to this for one. that next step but that's why we want this in this kind of list because we don't want just like the easiest games for new players we want you to have some depth in your collection as well and this is a great like next step game where you can really start getting into some high high yeah. strategy games but don't have a ton of rules overhead and castle of Burgundy is a great example it's also um uh generally relatively cheap, which is also a lot of these games on here, none of which are humongous or super, super expensive. Yeah, we don't want you to break your bank before no. you even know if you like this, but this is a an all-time classic, yes. highly regarded game, The Castles of Burgundy. Indeed, and so that is our number eight. Let's go ahead and get number seven. Our number seven is uh, a real silly game. It's called That's Not a Hat. Listen, sometimes <laughs> things are hats and sometimes things are not hats. Sometimes they're buckets, sometimes they're skateboards. This is a pure silly party memory Would game. Would you need those in your collection? Absolutely you, you do. absolutely need silly party games. It is a game all about memory, and it will humble you so fast because you'll realize that none of us have good memory at all. It's There's so too true. much junk in our brain yeah. floating around to remember stuff. Too many old so. boys to men lyrics in there. You know? Absolutely, man. You know? So, <laughs> Okay, man, that's just a God, banger, though. Bang. God, we did so many cast parties. It doesn't matter. Okay, uh, in this game, you have different items that are kind of this like sketch drawing uh, thing, and some of them are simple. You might have a safety pin and a paper clip and stuff. They're all sorts of different yeah. things. But very and, simple. And you are gifting these to other players. Now the problem is, you start off with everything face up. Uh, and I have a traffic cone, for example. Mm -hmm. But what you do is you're going to uh, eventually take a new gift 
that will come to you. Your old gifts will get put face down and you're gonna pass it in the direction that the arrows are, are going. So eventually you start to have a bunch of things that are now moving around and are no longer visible. Yes. So you have to track what you've given to people and track what's been over here at the table because something might come to you and you have to try to remember if that indeed is a frog. And if it's not, you can say, that's not a frog. And you can flip it over and basically yeah. challenge people. Exactly. And if you are correct and they were mistaken and they lied to you saying, because they're going to say, here's this frog that I'm gifting Enjoy you. Enjoy this skateboard. Enjoy this gnome. Uh, whatever it might be, you can kind of say, that's not what that is. Yeah. And test to see if they remember what they're sending you or if they're trying to bluff you out. Yeah. Uh, and you're trying to kind of knock people out of the game. It's a game that has no right to be as fun as it is. <laughs> it's just, it's immediately, the whole thing breaks into giggles because you're like, oh, this will be fine. But things turn over and, and then two twice, shifts happen. You're like, and then you immediately like, I have no idea right. where anything is anymore. Nope. And like, you're supposed to be really like blustery and confident being like, take this frog. But we're always just like, uh, take this frog? But no one at the <laughs> table is actually confident in what it is. So everyone else is like, that's thank, not a frog. Thank <laughs> you, you for the frog, I think. And like, here's and a it's mitten. Just like, it goes over so well yeah. every single it's time. It's just play silly. It. It's just silly fun, but you need these games. And it's yeah. just so simple to teach, so simple to play. You can play at like a family gathering with like all sorts of different ages. Yeah. You can play with like really serious gamers, and it's like it's just silly fun. It brings everyone to the same level. Yeah. Where <laughs> everyone sucks. And yeah. it's just like it's just great. It's a wonderful game. That's not a hat, it's amazing. You can literally put it in your pocket so small. Yeah. Uh yeah, you can pick them up at like Barnes and Noble and things like it's that. So that's not a hat's yeah. amazing. It's number seven. Let's go to get number six. Number six is going to be another one that's maybe a little bit of a step this is up. A, this is a, we're going to grow into this game Indeed. Game. And this is going to be a drafting game called, uh, It's a Wonderful World. I almost said that's not a hat. <laughs> it's a Wonderful World. It's going to be a drafting game where you're going to have a hand of cards. You're going to choose one, and then you're going to pass those cards to the right or to the left. That's drafting. You're taking it and drafting. Yeah, you only get one, and the rest go around the table. Exactly. There's lots and lots of different games with, uh, with drafting in it. Um, and this is a game where it's ultimately relatively simple, where you're getting these cards. These cards are going to be some kind of like kind of historical event. The theme is there. But it's in the future. It's, it's like a few future, semi-futuristic. Some of the stuff's in the past. It's weird. You're like traveling through. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? It's got cool art. It's just though. fun. And basically, these cards are going to have um, resources that they need in the top left. So that's what you need to uh, build these cards. You'll put them down on the table and you'll start generating those resources and putting all these cards. Once that card is full of those resources and that card is officially built, it'll go into your production row. And your production row, every round, will essentially produce these resources that you need for these cards. And so basically, you're trying to get them built and trying to get them in your production row so that they're producing resources so you can build more cards. But the cool thing is, is every time, whenever you get your full hand of cards after all the drafting is done, you either have to choose to start building those cards and start putting resources on them, or you can choose what's called doing what's called recycling them. Because every card, if you just discard it, will give you, give a you resource. one resource of a specific color. And so color. there's like this constant when you're drafting, like, am I going to try and build this or am I going to recycle this? Yeah, that's an important balance point because you don't want to build everything. You're probably not going to have enough time. You're going to build like two cards a turn. Yeah, but you want it so you want everything to kind of filter into like I want to make sure I get these these buildings done, uh, these cards done rather as quick as possible, so they're up and running and now providing me points and resources for my empire yeah. uh, and then you can kind of move on so it's a fun game to figure out that balance now again this is a little bit of a grow into game yes. if you want like another simpler drafting game you can try a game like sushi go by yes. phil walker harding which is about having the most delicious sushi meal it's gonna be a set collection of i want two tempura yeah. or three uh sashimi and stuff like that but yeah, this one this game with that production gives you more stuff to munch on yeah. while keeping that drafting of, of cards around the table mm -hmm. uh, intact, which is yeah, really it's cool. still relatively simple, but yeah. again, it's definitely a, a bit of a step up, kind of like Castle Burger. It's going to be a game you're going to grow really, into. really fun. Absolutely outstanding. Um, it's a wonderful world. It's really, really great. So, so good. number six, let's go to number five. Number five is going to be a cooperative game. This is Absolutely. a game where all the same team uh, playing against the game. This is going to be Paint the Roses. Because it's a cooperative deduction game. Indeed. So this is going to be a game where you are in the Alice in Wonderland world and you are trying to paint the, the queen's garden uh, so you don't get your head chopped off. And survival is a strong motivator. It is. It and we is. are all working together to do this. Now, the queen has different whims. They want uh, the garden to look a certain way and have different color roses. And also the kind of shape of the shrubbery will be in the different suits, classic suits of cards like yeah. spades and hearts and things like that. And uh, we each have a different whim. The queen has basically told us all a different 
thing that she wants the garden to look and like. She also said, "You're not allowed to share this with." Yeah, me. don't you share. Can't it. tell anyone what I want. She's <laughs> yeah, really. It's like that thing where you're not supposed to talk about salary because it's gauche, but it's really just a way to underpay everybody. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing, it's that right? Kind of thing, yeah. So uh, uh, here, what you're going to do is you're going to place a tile in the garden if you're the active player, yeah. and then you can put <laughs> cubes out if that tile placement makes matches based on what you need. So sometimes you might need red roses touching yellow roses. So if I put a, re a red rose tile down, it's touching two yellow rose tiles. I'll put two cubes out saying yeah. this makes two matches. Any other player, if it happens to make a match with their whim, and maybe you have an idea about, I think Nick wants these two types yeah. of shrubs together. Uh, they can also place cubes saying that it makes a match for them. Then we can discuss, of course I can't say what my whim is, that would get me killed. Uh, but we can, you know, all talk openly about, you know what, they keep putting these matches on this. I see a lot of yellow to red. I think that's what this is. And then you have to make at least one guess as to one person's card. Yes. If you're correct, yay, you get to move your little gardener around the board, which means you're further away from the queen, AKA further away from the ax. Yep. Uh, if you are incorrect, the queen is going to move twice as fast that turn. The queen always moves, but they'll move double speed, which yeah. is not good because if they you ever catch your gardeners, guess you're out. Yeah. No, you don't want to guess willy nilly, and you can guess multiple cards, yes. but you have to always guess at least one. Yes, and it's so it's so really, fun. It's really fun and tough to the put that puzzle game, together. At the beginning of the game, like the the queen's pretty far away, you get really confident and stuff. But as yeah, the no, game great. goes on, it gets harder and harder because you can pick different levels of whims. Yep. Easy whims, medium, or hard. Hard and medium ones will allow you to move farther. Easy whims are easier to get, but they don't allow you to move far. But the thing is, the queen is going to speed up as the game goes on. She gets more and more so enraged. You have to do medium and hard ones. You can't stick to easy. She is going to catch you. There's literally, mathematically, it's not possible to win by just doing easy. Yeah. So you have to do these harder ones. And it's just so fun to put things down and just try and deduce together. Because there's so many realms of information like what you put down what you didn't put down you're like well if it's pink to yellow why didn't mike pick this one that would have been a way better one or why didn't mike put it over here in the garden yeah not over there <laughs> so, there's so much information you're conveying but with a really really simple rule set where it's just like you get a whim you put a tile out you put matches out and then Make you have guess. to guess that's the game but there's so much of this other deduction part of it. And everyone's working together. So everyone's on the same team, cheering each other on, trying to do it. And then the queen's just slowly moving forward with her axe trying to kill you and stuff. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's got great art, great production value. It's a, such a, such a good game to have in a collection. Um, and it's an absolute banger. Agreed. Agreed. That is Paint the Roses. Highly recommend. It's a really high quality game as well. Yes. Uh, one to check out for sure. So that is number five, Paint the Roses. Getting to number four. Number four is a classic game, and we'd be uh, wrong to not have at least one Reiner Canizia game in here. And this is going to be yeah. raw. <laughs> this is raw. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, uh, this is a this is an auctioning game, a bidding game, ultimately, where you are a slash set collection. Again, set yes. collection is you want three pairs of things, stuff yes. like that. Uh, so uh, this is a game where. On your turn, you can basically add a new tile if there's space for it into this kind of lot of tiles. Um, there are raw t tiles that come out that cause you to have an auction, or if you like the kind of lot of tiles that's out there when it comes to your turn, you can instead invoke raw and begin an auction yourself. Yes. So you can force an auction to happen. Certain things will make the game push the game forward with those auctions, or you can just add tiles if you're not really happy with what is out there. Uh, when you go to bid, you have these three uh, or fewer tokens, depending on how far in the round you are, that you can bid that will have a number on yeah. it. And you simply bid one thing. If I'm the person who started the auction, I will bid last, yeah. so I'll have the last kind of crack at it. Uh, and whoever wins has to turn in their, their token. They get a different token in return, and they get to take any of those tiles, and they have to add them out here. Yeah. Different tiles do different things. There's all these monuments where you want to have a bunch of the same ones or a bunch of different ones. Uh, you can build out the Nile River, but you have to have these flooding tokens in order for them to score. Yeah. There's a bunch of different stuff like that that are going to uh, score you points based on how they get collected uh, from round to round. Yeah. So you, uh, but that's really the whole game. That's really the whole. It's game. like draw a tile, do an auction, and that's and it. And there's so much. <laughs> again, it, again, like like a lot of these ones, it's like the rules are going to be relatively low, but there's yeah. just still a lot of really juicy decisions in there. Indeed, and that's the whole point of board games. It's like. Tough decisions. Oh, do I do this or do I do this? That's right. like the crux of good board games. And why a lot of like kind of mass market board games for a childhood weren't great because usually there's not very many decisions. Nope. Whereas nowadays, there's a lot better board games that give you really good decisions, even within a simple rule set. Yeah. And that a game like Raw gives you a place where you can get into and start playing 
But as you play, you're you like, will start to oh. discover like, oh, you know what? That tile that I bid with, it might be a 15, a very high number. Yes. The tile that I'm gonna take like a is two. a two. So that means in my next round, I'm not gonna have a very good tile. Yes. So the the figuring that part out is like another level yes. of strategy that you can really think about as you grow with the game. Yes. So there's a lot to unpack, but the bare bones rule set it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple, yeah. There's so much to unpack. It's so, so good. It's awesome. Raw is wonderful. Um, and the, the newer version that it's came out a year or two ago, it's really, really pretty with new art, new production. So it's, it's gorgeous nowadays, yep. too. Raw is amazing. It's a classic for a reason. There's a reason why it got a new version, because it's a classic. So yes, indeed. Raw is number four. Let's go ahead and get number three. You generally, in your collection, want to have at least one or two two-player games, because yep. a lot of times... In this case right here, we're always That's all we players. got. So two-player games are great. We're going to choose Unmatched for ours. Now, technically, don't add us in the comments. You can play this game three or four players. Don't do that. Vast, vast majority of people play it two-player, yeah. which is, in our opinion, how it should be played. This is a two-player head-to-head game where each of you is taking a hero from Myth and Legend or from some IPs. There's like Marvel ones, Buffy, uh, Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. yeah. And you are going head to head. Each player is going to have a unique deck. Each character, rather, is going to have a unique deck that's completely unique to them. And it's very, very simple, though. This is a game where you can teach a couple minutes. On your turn, you can do a couple different things. You can maneuver. When you maneuver, you're going to draw a new card. And then you can move your pieces, uh, your mini, and if they have any side keys, you can move them up to their move value, which is just on their card, usually two or three. Yeah. So you can move them around. And then uh, you can also attack, which means you're going to play a card face down. And then the person you're attacking will play, uh, hopefully, a defense card face down. Whoa. And then you flip over simultaneously and you resolve them. And on the cards, they'll tell you exactly what they do. Yep, there's a bunch of different actions and little things they do to, to change up, but it's all it's written like, out. If I hit Mike for five, but he defended for four, I do one damage to him. So it's just yep. very simple. The difference is what you do, whereas Mike defended the whole thing, he obviously wouldn't take any damage. And the last thing you do is play a scheme card. An event card, essentially. Yeah, exactly. So you'll have these specific cards. You'll play it. You'll do what it says. They can do a whole bunch of different stuff, and that's it. But that's the game, and you win when you defeat the other player's hero. But this game is so good because that's like basically all the rules. And yet each deck is so different, plays yeah. totally differently. Whereas if you're playing like Sinbad from the original set, he's very, very fast. And as the game goes, he gets faster and moves farther and farther and farther. So you're trying to like move in and out, move around, hit, get back, and all this kind of stuff. If you're um, King Arthur, you're just kind of big and tanky. You're just kind of trying to stand there and hit people over and over and yeah. over again. If you're the Raptors of Jurassic Park, there's actually three of you and yes. you're trying to work as a team and the pack hunters. Kind of flank everybody. And you kind yeah. of are stronger when you work together that way. And at this point, there's... I think 40 40 odd characters, almost 50 different characters. There's a whole bunch of different sets. So it's also one of those games where if you have no interest in like the heroes and legends one, but you love Marvel, you can buy the Marvel sets. There's like six of them at this point. Yeah. If you have, you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you can buy the Buffy set. If you really like the kind of heroes and legends one, you can buy one of those. There's so many different ones and you don't have to have them all. They come in packs of either two, three or four. They're all playable individually. They have their own boards and And stuff. So you can only take the pieces you like. Yeah. Yeah, You can have Buffy the Vampire Slayer go against literally Dracula, which is in a different set. Yeah. And so you can do all this kind of stuff. They also now are starting to introduce some cooperative ones where you're playing together against some kind of, usually some kind of cryptids, like Mothman or like mm-hmm. an alien invasion. And they are expanding this game constantly. They have like two yeah. or three sets a year. And this is a game where you can kind of pick and choose what you want. And it is so much fun. And it's yeah. got some of the best art in any board game's effort. The art is, absolutely incredible. is wildly cool. Uh, they've had different artists and stuff that all bring their own flair to yes. it. Every character feels unique. They have their own interesting flavor. And again, dead simple to understand. Everything is written out for you to tell yep. you how they work. So there's very few uh, things to wonder about. It yep. is all explicitly stated, uh, which makes this game really fun to explore. And again, with all those characters, go any which way you like and then start mixing and matching yeah. as you please. Because again, everything's different. There's, there's a there's a burgeoning tournament scene for this oh, game, yeah. so it's getting popular in that part. It's so much fun. And you can start off with just a little two-pack, see if you like it, and then if you want, start buying some more. Unmatched is incredible. It's great for a first-time collection. It's number three, let's get number two. Our number two is gonna be for kind of like that, people who love satisfying game, that kind of Tetris enthusiasts, this is gonna be Project L. Right. Project L is a game where you are given, uh, you are getting these cards. These cards are kind of like dual layer cards. They have a little bit of a recess in them. Yep. And you're gonna fill in that void, that recess with these really satisfying acrylic tiles. And they gotta go clinky, 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 clinky. very nice, very bright and colorful. Yes. And yeah, if you get that whole recess filled in, you will then complete that puzzle. Yep. 
which will, will usually give you points and will always give you kind of a new piece to use yeah. because you want to be as efficient as you can in yes. this game. You want to be able to fill in that uh, puzzle with as few pieces as possible because every piece you add takes an action. I think you get two or three actions on a turn. Yeah. So the less pieces you have to use to complete that puzzle, the better. And again, gives you points and more pieces to use on uh, this kind of ever-growing pool yeah. of stuff. So it's yeah. got a lot of satisfaction. It just is. That's game. that's what it is. It's just satisfying. And it's just very, it's, it's inherently intuitive to understand because you're just like, oh, here's a void. Here's pieces. I need to get them in. Fill this in with these. It just makes sense. And people yeah. immediately understand 75% of that game just by looking at that card and looking at those pieces. Like, oh, I'm supposed well, to fill this let's in. Go on here. Okay, cool. They just get it. And then on top of that, it's just a little puzzle. People like fitting things together. That's why the games like Tetris are so popular. Because it's just satisfying to be like, oh, this the bar is coming down. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Oh, it's gonna be great. Piece in. Beep. It's very satisfying. People like that. And that's kind of what this game is. And you're just building out these little cards filling in with these pieces, and then you're trying to score the biggest ones, the ones that are worth more points, will have a bigger void in there, so it takes more pieces to fill in, trying to do that efficiently. It's just really, really fun. It's got a great look, and it's just a game that you can play with really anybody. Um, and then on top of that, it doesn't have really a theme other than just like pieces, so there's also just like, it just goes over well because people yeah. just like it. It's just satisfying. And so it's really, really good for your collection because you can kind of just bring it out with anybody, family, friends, kids, whatever, and you can just make it work. Yep, absolutely. That is number two, Project L. Highly recommend. Uh, and she's got a great tactile experience to boot, but we do have one game we recommend higher than those all. This is number one. Number one is a great game. This is going to be Cascadia. Yes. This is a game where you're building out uh, a kind of a big uh, landscape and ecosystem yeah. in the Pacific Northwest in Cascadia. And so you are going to start off with a little tile and then you're going to be drafting these hexagonal tiles. And these hexagonal tiles are going to be paired with a random animal, which is like an elk, a salmon, salmon fox, bears, bear, hawks. hawk. Yeah. And... Um, and then you will take that pairing and then you will put that tile somewhere in your growing landscape and you can match landscapes if you want to, like forest next to forest, but you don't have to. And then each space in your, um, each hex in your, in your tableau will then have one or more animals that can house, um, that can be housed on that tile. Yep. So then you take the animal that you drafted and you put it in a spot that's appropriate for that animal. Whether or not it's that same tile you just drafted. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And so, and then that's the whole game. And then at the end of the game, there are different scoring conditions for each animal and the animals will all kind of want to be in different configurations. Yeah, so the salmon might want to be in one connected run, they call it. So yeah. each kind of tile goes to the next. The hawks might not want to be next to each other because they're all, you know, predators looking for prey, things yeah. like that. And how those animals score will change from game to game. So we mentioned cartographers at the beginning of yeah. this list. Uh, it's similar here where maybe, you know, based on the scoring conditions of this game, you're going to want to build out your whole ecosystem, your tile and token combos. Yeah differently, which is really, really Yeah, because cool. like one game, the elk might want to be in one big clump. Yep. And then the next game, they might want to be in a big straight line. And like the bears might want to all be separate. But the next game, they want to be in like a bunch of little groups. Yep. And so the scoring completely changes the game because you're going to build out your whole habitat yeah. in a different way. But again, it's very simple. You go, okay, how do the foxes score in this one? Okay, cool. And so it's just very easy to flip those out. But because they're different every game, they just change it up every time. Every time feels different. You also don't know the order of the tiles coming out, what tiles are gonna get paired with what animals. Nope. And so it just, it's always new, it's always fresh. It's got really wonderful art by a woman named Beth Sobel who does a lot of board game art. This Such kind of art. really beautiful animal nature art. It's so pretty. It just goes over well with pretty much everybody. Absolutely, it's a nice chill, relaxing theme, one that we highly recommend. So we recommend all these games, but of course, yes. there are so many more games a that you can more. start with, <laughs> yeah. just a few. Uh, the ones that we came up on, uh, you know, were different. Some of these ones are ones that we recommend now. So we want for uh, uh, you, if you're new to the hobby, again, welcome. Check out the comments in this because yes. anyone that is here that is watching this video and consider yourself in the hobby a little bit or just simply want to share the game that got you Write into the comment. hobby, put a comment down, please, because we want to make this a big living document so that people can come in and look through those comments and get a ton of game yes. recommendations. This should be a community-led effort. Yeah. And on that note, please share this video yes. around. Share it on Facebook and other places because we want to kind of cast a wide net and see if we can get some new board gamers in yeah, here. Yeah, our, our whole goal of our channel really is to grow the hobby. We want more people playing board games. It's a wonderful, wonderful hobby, and we want more people in it. It does better with more people in it. It does indeed. Um, you've been seeing our patrons scroll by here. We want to give a big, big shout-out to our patrons. They kind of keep this whole thing going. We yes, really appreciate do. you. And over on our Patreon, we're going to have 10 more games that we think are really, really good places to 
to start. So if you're interested, consider supporting our Patreon today, and you'll find some other supplemental lists over there. Absolutely. Until next time, everybody, thank you so much for joining. If you're new to us, please consider subscribing. We are the Brothers Murph. I am Mike. I'm Nick. We, are, again, are the Brothers Murph, and we'll catch you all next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for watching that top 10. Again, sorry about that sound snafu. Just, gosh, we're cursed when it comes to sound. It sure as heck feels like it. But we really hope you enjoy that. Again, if you're an experienced gamer, make sure to write down your uh, games that you would think you should start your collection with down in the comments. And if you're a new person, go check out the comments. They're going to be pretty darn cool down there. want to give a big shout out to our channel sponsors, Restoration Games, Lucky Duck Games, and Board Game Geek. And a big shout out to you for watching this video. Thank you so much. Have a great day.